we change our priorities that we have now? Will we change the way that we're living now? Would it, would it finally get a grip on us to know that there's more important things in life than what we're doing right now? While this man in this song chose to take some chances, he said he loved deeper, he spoke sweeter, and he gave the forgiveness he had been denying. He became the husband that most of the time that he had not been, and he read the Bible and realized that tomorrow was not a gift. It's not something that's going to be granted to us. Would the need for God in our lives become real to us? Would we, would we really realize just how short life really is? I would, I would hate to think that it would take something like that to get my attention You know, I've been, born, I've been born and raised in church. I say that I was 12 when I received the Holy Ghost. I feel like I've been born and raised in church. But it's, it's a sobering thought, and I begin to think about this, and I, I've said it a lot of times when I feel like the Lord's giving me a lesson. A lot of times it's for me, and then I begin to share it with some other people. You know, would I change my ways? What, what would I do? There's things that I do need to change in my life. I'll just be honest and open with you this morning. I'm sure we all do, but... It gets a grip on us when we realize that life is short. The title to this song is, in fact, true. When we are born, the death process begins. That's kind of a grim way of looking at it, but actually the death process begins when we're born, Sister Jessica. Death is inevitable. It's something that we're all going to face someday unless the rapture of the church takes place. We're all going to go by the way of grave unless the, the rapture of the church takes place. Romans 5 and 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered, into the, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 6 and 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And, and I think one of the biggest mistakes that we make in living for God is that we really do not understand the love that he has for us. And how much care that he has for us. He loves us. He gave his life for us as I've already said. The prophet Hosea said that the people of his day were destroyed because of their lack of knowledge of God. They did not really see and understand him, Sister Judy. And do we really have a revelation this morning of how much God really cares for us. How much that he really, really loves us. Luke chapter 12 records the parable of the rich fool whose ground brought forth a, a plentiful crop. He had just more crop than he knew what to do with. And he asked, his, he asked his himself, he said, what shall I do? Because I've got no room to store all this grain that I'm bringing in. So he decides to tear down the barns that he already had, Brother Billy, and he decides to build bigger barns. And he says to himself, so thou hast much goods laid up for many years. I've got it made. Got all this crop. I've got it made. Life is good. He said, I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to eat, and I'm going to drink, and I'm going to be merry. But God said, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of him. His time was short, and he didn't realize that it was that close. He was going to, he was going to just sit back and take it easy. He was just going to sit back and coast. But God said, it's not going to be that way. Not going to be that way. The Lord tells his disciples, he said, take no thought of your life, what you shall eat or what you're going to wear. Consider the ravens that neither sow nor reap or have storehouses or barns because God feeds them. How much more are you than the fowls of the air or the lilies of the field? How they grow, they toil not nor spin. Yet Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed as one of these or robed as one of these. If God clothes them, and he takes care of them, how much more is he going to take care of us? How many of you found that to be true? The blessings of God. He's going to take care of us. The Bible tells us to cast our care upon him, for he careth for us. Sister Maria, he loves us. He's going to take care of us. The Bible has many references in it uh, concerning the providences and the protection of God. Isaiah 25 and 4, Brother Shannon, these are not in there. But Isaiah 25 and 4 says, He shelters his people as a refuge. Psalms 57 and 1 says, He's there in the time of troubles. 
Isaiah 51 and 16 says we are, the sh- we are in the shadow of his hand. Matthew 23 and 36 and uh, Psalms 91 and 4 says we are under the shadow of his wings. Psalms 121 and 4 says he's a sleepless watchman. Psalms 115 and 12 says he watches over us with infinite care. He loves us and he cares about us. We can read it over and over and over within the scriptures about God's love for us and his concern for us. I believe that's important that we understand that this morning. I believe one of the first steps we've got to take in living like we're dying, as this song says, is to live with a sense of urgency. And that word urgency there means that which requires immediate action. What would we do today if we knew the Lord was going to come back tomorrow? I'm sure there would be a sense of urgency about us, like you said earlier, to get yourself right or to get myself right. You know, um, we have a tendency to procrastinate. How many of you know what procrastinate means? How many of you procrastinate? Why well, rather, yeah, why well, rather do it today, Brother McKinney, when we can do it tomorrow? Are we going to procrastinate when it comes to living for God? Why should I do it today when I've got my whole life ahead of me? When I can put it off till tomorrow to get myself right, get my heart right. When I've got that time, I can do it then. We're not rewarded that time, Brother Doyle. It's not promised to us to have tomorrow. That's why each day is important. That's why each day we need, we need to make the most of it. We, we, don't, we don't have that promise. The scripture I read in 1 Peter 4, 7, and 8 tells us that the end of the world is coming soon. It says, therefore, be earnest. That means to be serious. Thoughtful men of prayer, and most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. Now, I'm sure you have, and I have, ever since I've been living for God, my whole life I heard that God's coming. You know, uh, I'm 49, received the Holy Ghost when I was 12, 37 years, and I've heard the same thing, God's coming, God's coming. Well, how much closer now am I to him coming or the time of my death than what it was then? It's very important. That we take it serious. Not only for us, but those around us. Uh, I want to look at the 20th chapter of 2 Kings, and we're going to talk about a man by the name of Hezekiah. Hezekiah had been told by the prophet Isaiah that death was knocking at his door. Hezekiah, you're going to die. And he wasn't going to live. 2 Kings 21 through 6 says, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thy house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember how I have walked before thee in truth with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. And it came to pass before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee on the third day. Thou shalt go up into the house of the Lord. And I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, And I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Hezekiah, you're going to die. You're not going to live. The Bible says that he turned his face to the wall and he began to pray. He began to pray. And really, it it marked, Brother Robbie, it marked a sad turning point in Hezekiah's life. Up until that point, he'd been faithful. He'd been true to God. He reminded God of all the things that he had done and his life was, was good, but then after the fact, when God added the 15 years to his life, he became proud and he became selfish. And it led to his demise. But when we 
when we look at the story of Hezekiah, we see a man that was, hey, your time has come. It's over with, Sister Eloise. And the Bible says uh, Hezekiah did not get mad. He did not get angry against God, but he turned himself toward the wall, and he began to pray unto the Lord. Hezekiah had some things that he wanted to remind the Lord of. He had some things that he wanted to tell the Lord of. He said his faithfulness in his walk before the Lord in truth. He reminded him of his perfect heart. He had always done the right things. He was sincere as he wept before the Lord. <clears throat> and as we sit here this day, we have no idea as to when God is going to call us out of this world or when the rapture will even take place. The Bible says no man know the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. We, we don't have any clue. But we have to live with a sense of urgency to live right each and every day of our lives. we got to live with that sense of urgency. Moses said in Psalms 90 and 12, he says, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are and help us to spend them as we should. Teach us, Lord, what we need to do. The Bible tells us and lets us know that our lives are as fragile as grass. Uh, in Psalms 95 through 6, it lets us know that life is short. In Psalms 90 and 10 and in James 4 and 14, the passage that I read, cherish those things around you. 1 Corinthians 13 is known as the love chapter. And it talks about love, love, love. That's what it deals with. Aaron, will you get me a bottle of water? My throat is kind of getting dry. So there's, a, there's a saying called carpe diem. And that, that term means seize the day. Seize the day because life is short. Make each day count. Live purposefully and meaningful and remember God each and every day. It's so important in our walk with God each and every day. It's hard to teach or it's hard to preach without referring to the Apostle Paul. He's a prominent figure of the New Testament church. We all know that he was the apostle that was called to the Gentile nation, which is exactly who we are. And he brought the gospel message to the Gentile nation. And I've often talked about his conversion on the road to Damascus and, and how God reached down and, and blinded him and, and changed his life, Brother Billy. He changed Paul's life. And because... God changed Paul's life. Paul basically changed the world in which he lived in. Paul had such an impact on the world that he lived in. It was just unbelievable how much of an impact that he did. He shared this gospel from the common man that he met on the street and to the kings that he stood before with a death sentence given to him. He did not hesitate, Brother Johnny, to share this gospel with whoever he came in contact with. You talk, you talk about the Apostle Paul, you talk about a man that went through some things. And I don't know if it's true, but I've read that history that Paul was a, he was a short, we wanna, we, when we think about the Apostle Paul and uh, the, the kind of man that he was, we kind of get a picture of a great big man that was just masculine, you know, because he went around change, changing people and changing the world. But history kind of tells us that Paul was a little bow-legged man that was bald-headed, that he, that he couldn't hardly see. We knew he had a vision problem. He's not the picture of the image that we, that we think, Brother Marcus, but he changed the world in which he lived in. You know, three times he was beaten with rods. He was stoned and left dead. Uh, he went without clothes. He, he was in hunger and perils and, and, and so many different things that the Apostle Paul went through. But in Philippians 3, 7, and 9, he gives us some kind of insight into his desire in serving God. Whatever he had to go through. He said, but what things were gained to me, those I counted for loss. Apostle Paul was an educated man. He was a Roman citizen. He sat at the feet of Gamal. And he was taught the Jewish way. He knew it frontwards and backwards, Brother Robbie. He was taught by the law. And he knew that. He said, these things that were gained to me, everything that I had that was gained to me, he said, those I counted for the loss of Christ. I was willing to give up whatever I had to spread this message of Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but 
lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Paul said, I suffered the loss of all things. I really didn't have anything at all. And do count them but dung that I may win Christ. That I might win Christ. And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now Paul makes this statement. He says, He suffered a loss of everything, but he counts it as dung. And that word means refuge. It means worthless. It really didn't mean anything to him at all, to tell you the truth. Paul realized the ultimate goal in his life was a personal, intimate relationship, Brother Pete, with God. He says, by the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and the Greek word for knowledge here is G-I-N-O-S-K-O, genisko, which means to know by experience. Paul knew Christ by experience. He knew him by being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He knew by walking with him each and every day and doing the will of the Lord. That's how the Apostle Paul knew God. Through his knowledge. He had a personal relationship with God by experience. A direct communication with God. We can also have that personal relationship with him today. It has not changed. How many of you believe we're living on borrowed time? Today is the day to feel an urgency to respond to God. If I've, if I've studied the scripture right and I've heard it preached, there's not another prophecy that really has to be fulfilled before God can come back. Not another prophecy. There's nothing that's holding him back but the prayers of the saints. Nothing holding him back. He could come back today. Right now. It doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't matter. He could come back because there's nothing holding him back. First Peter 2 and 9 says, This is the day in which we live in. A year of chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The job's been placed on us to spread the gospel today. There's an urgency that we should have in our life and in our walk with God to live with a sense of urgency. I've got a couple poems I want to read to you right now. Uh, it says, The clock of life is wound but once, and no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop. At a late or early hour, to lose one's health is sad indeed. And to lose one's health is even more. To lose one's soul is such a loss that no man can restore. And I don't know if these facts are true. I I picked this up in studying. But it says on an average, 39 people died while I read this short poem. It can take me about a matter of seconds. But it said 39 people died while I read this short poem. Every hour, 600 people die and go to meet their maker. And any one of us could have been one of them. In reality, sooner or later, it will be. Today is all we really have. Life, death, and eternity make up the ingredients of life, if you will. The poem says, life is full of risk. To laugh is to risk appearing a fool. To weep is to risk appearing sentimental. To reach out to another is to risk involvement. To expose feelings is to risk exposing one's true self. To place your ideas in your dreams before a crowd is to risk ridicule. To love is a to love is to die is to risk dying. To hope is to risk despair. To try is to risk failure, but Risk must be taken because the greatest mistake of life is to risk nothing at all. The person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, and is nothing. They may avoid suffering and sorrow, but they cannot learn to feel, to change, to grow, or to love and live. To choose to live for God is a risk to expose ourselves to criticism from our friends or our families 
or to open ourselves up from an attack by the devil, but it's, it's worth the risk of taking. It's worth the risk of taking. Go right ahead, Brother Pete. No, that's fine. I told you I, I, I don't. Amen. Very good, Brother Pete. It goes right along with this. My next point I want to make is that we need to live with a sense of eternity. And this, this next point really, really, really drives home. When our life ends, eternity begins. You, talk, you think about it like that. When our life ends, Brother Billy, eternity begins. Eternity is forever. Never, never ends. Romans thirteen eleven through 14 says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awaken out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in tamering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provisions to fulfill the lust of the flesh or the lust thereof. Today is the day. If I get a point across to you this morning, today is the day of salvation because we're not promised tomorrow. Go ahead, Brother Billy. That's right. anything at all. Eloise. Right.
right? Some people are not just like that. You're right. None of us. It's your time. And it's, it's so true. That's right. We don't. We have no idea. You're right, Sister Liz. That's right. You're right, Sister Sandy. Can relate to that. No, he didn't. 
a lot of times it's not that way, right? Yep. Right. 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 That's that's miracle of God. That's right. That, that's the story of mercy. It's the story of grace. Amen. Brother Cook? Mm-hmm. Yep. Amen. God's good. He's good. There's an intriguing story. When I made the statement I made a while ago, when our lives end, eternity begins, there's an intriguing story from the life of Winston Churchill. And He was a British prime minister. Uh, he died at the age of 90, I think it was January 1965. But as he was making plans for his funeral, he asked to be laid in state at the heart of St. Paul's Cathedral. And he requested that his casket be placed under the massive dome there inside the, the cathedral, right in the center of it. Then he requested that there to be two trumpeteers placed on each side of the balcony that circled the dome, one on each side. And it was Churchill's wish that at the close of his service, at the close of his, his death and service, the trumpeteer on one side would play Taps, which is the military song for Lights Out. And when he was finished, the other side would play the Reveille, which means it's the wake-up call. What a picture of reality of what it's really going to be like. We're going we're gonna to be death, and then eternity begins. And I'm here to tell you this morning, no matter what you think, it's either going to be heaven or it's going to be hell. And I, I know this is a sobering lesson, but the Lord kept bringing me back to this, maybe for somebody to hear this morning, for us to realize that we don't have the promise of tomorrow. We don't. Hebrews 9 and 27 says, As it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Eternity is a difficult concept for us to fully understand when we think about eternity. To think of a time that never ends. Webster's Dictionary defines eternity as continuance without beginning or end. A, a duration without end. The state of time after death. Forever in the immeasurable extent of time. It just goes on forever. It goes on forever. And I would, I, I, would, I would rather spend eternity in heaven than I would hell. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on the two in just a minute. When the Greek philosopher Socrates was told that his time had come, that he was going to die, they told him that he needed to prepare for death. He, he simply answered, Know ye not that I have been preparing for it all my life. I've been preparing for death all my life. And that's what we do when we're living for God. We're preparing for eternity. We're preparing for what life is going to be after we leave this world. I thought that it was a good point. As much as it is to take today for granted, it's an even bigger mistake on our part for us to take eternity for granted. What we do to today, what we do today makes a difference as to where we're going to spend eternity. Every situation, every moment is of infinite worth, for it is a representation of a whole eternity. Now, I really like this next, this next quote right here. It said, God has given to mankind a short time here upon earth. And yet, upon this short time, eternity depends. Every action of our life touches on a cord that will vibrate in eternity. 
the most important question we have to ask ourselves is if we die today, where will we spend eternity? And I don't, believe, I don't believe it's right to try to scare somebody into living for God. You're going to live for God because you love God. You want to do the right things. It's not, it's not for me to try to scare anybody this morning. It's just the reality of what it is, Sister Judy. It's the reality of what I've been taught by what the Bible says, and I believe it to be true. Brother McKinney taught it for years to us. My pastor in Malden, Brother Hill, taught it. Brother GL teaches it. It's either heaven or hell. Most, most, the way we look at it, Brother Marcus, is that we really should live for God because we love Him and we want to go, go to heaven. It's not that we don't want to go to hell. And hell, hell is going to be a real place. It, it is a real place. And in most studies done, the people that have been, been questioned about heaven or hell, most of them, Brother Shannon, want to believe in heaven, but they really don't want to believe in hell. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you this right now. God didn't create hell for us. He didn't create hell for us. It was never his intention that we would go to hell. He wanted that direct relationship between us and him. He wanted us all to go to heaven. But the sad sense of reality, that's not what it's going to be. That's not how it's going to be. Living with a sense of eternity brings in a focus because there will be a judgment day coming. There's the great white throne of judgment that you can read about in the Bible. Or there's the judgment seat of Christ, which is known as a place of rewards. He's going to be cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Or he's going to say, enter into the joys of the Lord. No one will escape judgment. Every knee and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's no escaping it. We're all going to go through that. There's people today that don't want to hear this. They don't want to hear how they're supposed to live or what the Bible teaches or what to do according to the Word of God. A lot of them want to live according to how they feel, what they think is right, what they, what they want to do. Proverbs 14 and 12 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but at the end there are, of, is the ways, are the ways of death. John 12, 48 through 50 says, and this is Jesus speaking, says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath, not, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment that I should say and what I should speak. And I know that this commandment is life everlasting. Whosoever I speak thereof, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. We're going to be judged by the Word of God in the way that it teaches us to live. It's what we're going to be judged by. Matthew 16, 26 through 27 says, What is a man profited that he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. Then he shall reward every man according to his works. It's not God's desire that we be lost. It's not God's desire that we be lost. Second Peter 3 and 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. That means he's willing to put up with our ways. That he puts up with the things that we do, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The scripture tells us that as it was in the days of Noah, where so shall it come, so, so shall it be in the coming of the Lord. They were eating, they were drinking, and they were giving in marriage until the day Noah entered into the ark. And no one knew it until it began to rain. And so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So let's just let's just say, and I don't have a clue. I don't have any. I don't have any idea in the world. Let's just say there were two million people that were living in the days of Noah when the flood took place. You know how many of those people were saved? Eight souls. Noah, 
in his family, Brother Robbie. And there might have been millions more. I have no clue. But eight people were saved. You know, we live in a world today that the thought of coming of the Lord is in the last thing that we want to think about. We've got, we've got too many other things that we've got on our mind, too many other things that's going on, and we really, really don't want to, we don't really want to think about that. Uh, Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. What many going to be that find that way? Place of destruction. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and a few there be that find it. A few. Is that going to include us? That's a sobering thought, Sister Eloise, when you think about that. It said a few that be there find it. My, my life application Bible reads, Heaven can be entered only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gates is wide enough for all multitudes that choose its easy way. But the gateway to life is small and the road is narrow and only a few ever find it. I've always, I've always said it and I believe it that everybody will have a chance to hear this gospel. The more we live at in this world, so in the foreign countries to where their jungles and what goes on it? Because everybody has a chance to hear the word of God. I believe that to be true. You can't judge one man that has never heard it and one man that has it. The Bible says straight gate is the narrow way. And one image I, I see this, you've been to a, a carnivore, you've been to Six Flags, or you've been to the ball game. There's these turnstiles that you have to walk through and what the purpose of that is is recording how many people enter into the stadium or the event that it is. If you ever walk through one of these turnstiles, they're kind of hard sometimes to push and get through. And that's, that's kind of the image that I see of this straight gate. There's only room enough for one at a time, and narrow will not always be the easiest way. Living for God will not always be the easiest way. Go right ahead. That's right. Obey it. That's right. That's not a popular term in the day and age which we live in, the word obedience or obey. That's right. Right. That's exactly right. 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 He's exactly right. Luke thirteen twenty three to twenty four says, Then said one unto the Lord, Are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter at the straight gate, for many I say unto you will seek to enter and shall not be able. Why? Maybe because they don't want to change their ways. Maybe they want to live life according to the way they want to live it, not according to the way the Word of God says. That's an awesome thought, Sister Kim. It's, it's, it's a good thought. Maybe that person is placed in our life. And I, not maybe. Let me, change, let me change what I said. Not maybe, but they are put in our way that we share this gospel. Right. Right. We, we've been given something that we have to share with people. 
And Brother Gilles even talked about being, it's hard for him to witness, but it's something that we, that we have to do. You know, and, and I'm bad about it. I'll just, I can be honest, honest and open up to you because I am who I am. But a lot of times I'll think, well, people know how I live just by the way that I live. You know, I, I, I've had, I've, I've had Sister Stacy you know, uh, Bob Knott, my supervisor, and he, he uh, has told me, he said, you're, you're a good person. You, you're a good man. You're honest. But you know what, Sister Stacy, I really hadn't shared the gospel with him. And that's, you know, that's not always good enough, no. You know, it's, it's, so, it's a sobering thought for us to think about this morning. When you say a few there be that find it, that word, that word that's used there when it says to strive used here is from a Greek word called agonize, which means to agonize. It means, that's, that means you're in pain. How many's ever been in agony? It means you're, you're hurting, you're in pain. It's also used in 1 Corinthians 9.25, speaking of an athlete agonizing to win a victory. In Colossians 4 and 12, used with the words laboring fervently. 1 Timothy 6.12, with the word fight. It's going to take a lot of effort on our part to enter that narrow way. A lot an effort on our part. And I'm going to tell you this this morning. I'm running out of time. But it's our choice and it's our decision. One of the greatest things that God ever gave us was the ability to choose. And we could go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. He put them in the Garden of Eden, and he told them, he said, you could eat of any tree in this garden except for one. What did they do? They couldn't obey him. They had to eat of that one tree. And that's a choice that we make today. Our choice that we make today. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people don't want to live for God because of their past, because of the things they've done in their past. A lot of them can't get over it, get get past it. Well, we've got to learn to leave that behind because that no longer matters. What we do from here on out is what matters for God. We've all made mistakes. We've all had errors in our way. We've we've done things that we're not proud of. But God forgives us and He puts it under the blood, and it's time for us to move on. We've got to choose to live for God. We've got to choose to live for God. The little foxes that spoil the vine. exactly right when I when I think about the choice between heaven or hell just Stacy I take I, I think about what John Michael said brother Shannon somebody asked him why he wanted the Holy Ghost for you know what his response was was he nine eight nine John Michael said that he wanted the Holy Ghost because he didn't want to go to hell and if that's not a good enough reason in the world to want to live for God I don't know what he is this morning he said, I want the Holy Ghost because I don't want to go to hell. That's such a sobering, a sobering thought. You know, I'm sure if I ask you this morning, would you want to go to heaven or would you want to go to hell, what's your response going to be? I want to go to heaven. But yes, there's people, Brother Manny, choosing each and every day to just keep living the same way that they were living and not willing to change. I taught, I taught a lesson a long time ago about the insanity of sin. And sin has such a hold on people. You know, a, a sane person, if you ask them this question, would you want to go to heaven or would you want to go to hell, their gonna, response is going to be, I want to go to heaven. But the grip of sin in people's life has such a hold on them, they're not willing to change and to live for God. So by doing so, they're sending their soul to hell. They're sending their soul to hell. Luke 16, and I don't, I don't have this in there. It's, it's the rich man and Lazarus. It's a story about rich man and Lazarus. And, and I will tell you, this is not a parable. 
You will not find in the notations of your Bible where this story is a parable. The Bible says that the rich man fared sumptuously every day. He was clothed in fine linen. But Lazarus was laid at his gates every day, poor, begging for bread, just the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. The Bible says that he had sores and the dogs would come and lick his sores. Two different individuals, and the Bible says that Lazarus died and he was carried up into Abraham's bosom, which is a place of rest, if you will, according to the Scripture. And the Bible says that the rich man died, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. And that word torments there means many. He was in pain. He was in agony. It's almost, Brother Pete, like the Bible gives us just a glimpse into hell if you will. He said, I want you to send Lazarus, which he didn't have any time for him when he was alive on earth, just to come and dip his nasty finger in a little bit of water and put it to his tongue because he was in many torments. Many, many torments. Hell is not a nice place. The, the Bible tells us in Matthew 18, 8, 9, it says, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life, halt or maim, rather than having two hands or two feet cast into the everlasting fire. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into the lake of fire. Heaven's going to be such a grand place. It's going to be such a, a, an awesome place. A city prepared for God for his saints. 1,500 miles squared, streets of gold, walls of jasper and different jewels and a pure river of life. Clear as a crystal proceeding out of the throne of God. And the tree of life which was in the Garden of Eden is going to be in heaven with us. We stand with me? I'm getting ready, getting ready to end. I still had a whole lot more, but... Eternity. Where are you going to spend eternity? God had given to man a short time here upon earth, and yet upon that short time, eternity depends. It's up to us. I think a lot of our our problems and a lot of our situations is that we're just too busy to take the time out of our life for God, Brother Kendall. Too many things that hinders us and gets in our way but psalms 46 and 10 says be still and know that i am god today is the right time in the right place for us to make up our mind that we're going to live for him And my question today is are we going to be willing to do that are we going to be willing to do that